we get started in a few minutes. Sorry, everyone, we apologize for, we just had a few technical difficulties. Is the chat working now? Um, I've met, if anyone has had issues, is having issues with the chat, um, I could respond. Some people are able to chat. Hopefully no one else is having an issue. So Linda, you were able to send the message. Mm -hmm. So let's get started. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on developing an educational growth mindset. Tonight's webinar will be centered around the importance of developing academic skills and addressing gaps early on in the educational journey in order to have the best opportunities when applying to college. We will be having two um, presenters for this webinar. Daniel Mehrabian from EduPros, he's the founder of EduPros, and Linda Megudichan, who's the director of tutoring at EduPros. EduPros is a college admissions counseling, um, consulting, excuse me, consulting and tutoring company based in Glendale that provides a holistic and personalized approach to college admissions guidance. They provide direct support to students that have been underserved at academic institutions or need additional guidance and support in their schools. We're really excited to have Linda and Daniel both here tonight for this webinar. So thank you both for being here. Um, I'd like to also give a brief introduction for uh, both of our speakers tonight. Daniel Mehrabian has a master's in education and is a well-known speaker and college consultant in the Los Angeles area with more than 15 years of experience in assisting families and students in navigating the college admissions process. His students have been accepted to the Ivy League universities, the UCs, and top international universities across the world. Daniel has given numerous presentations on behalf of ASA on the college admissions process. Linda Megardichan holds a bachelor's degree from Azad University and a master's degree in electrical engineering, digital and computer science from Cal, um, Cal State Northridge. Currently, she's a digital hardware design engineer designing digital logic for high-speed signal processing devices. Besides her love for engineering, Linda is also passionate about educating the youth. From 2015 to 2019, she worked as the Director of Curriculum Development at a private tutoring company. Previously, she was a math and physics instructor from 2008 to 2012. And currently, she's the Director of Tutoring at EduPros USA. And she's also a council member at ASA and a former board member and a very active member, I should say, as well. For the past 12 years, Linda has been focused on studying and understanding each student's needs based on their learning style, strengths and weaknesses, and other major factors that have a huge impact on learning. She believes everyone is gifted and the key to learning better is to discover and understand the student's needs and abilities so that an educator can utilize the most useful methods to help them learn more effectively. Linda is passionate about STEM and wishes to inspire and help the youth so that they can achieve their highest potential and make their dreams a reality. Um, I want to also remind everyone that we'll have a Q&A session toward the end of the presentations. So feel free to submit your questions if you have any questions for the presenters and we'll get to as many questions as we can towards the end. Um, with that, if you guys are ready, Linda, um, we can start the presentation. Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Narjan, for the introduction. Um, first, I'd like to thank ASA for uh, this opportunity today. Um, uh, we are very excited, and uh, we also appreciate the fact that ASA recognizes how important it is to focus on building the right foundation at an early age, uh, not only just uh, supporting and empowering the um, professionals and college students, but also uh, starting at um, high school level, and um, uh, we are happy to see ASA is very supportive of this and has some activities on the side to make sure that uh, we are successful in training the next generation of scientists and entrepreneurs and engineers and attorneys. So with that, I'll start the presentation. First, um, I'd like to focus on a subject that was uh, basically a theory by Dr. Carol Dweck, which was um, focused on growth mindset. Uh, it revolves around the belief that you can always improve intelligence, ability, and performance. Uh, years of research have, sh uh, have shown that mindset is 
malleable. And uh, that means by helping students to develop a growth mindset, we can help them to learn more, uh, learn effectively and efficiently, which is the base of how we work with our students. So let's just back up a little bit and focus on what learning is. Uh, learning, we all know learning is basically the simple definition of learning is to gain knowledge and retain it in long run, for long term. So uh, the way that each, um, I'm hearing an echo of my voice. I'm not sure if you guys are hearing that too or, sorry. Okay. So um, the way that the learning can be uh, more efficient is by uh, focusing on students' skills and their weaknesses and abilities and also using their strengths towards making it more, uh, uh, basically making the results better and better. Uh, the first subject that I would like to focus here uh, before moving on to the learning process uh, is the reason that we are ap approached, uh, basically the tutoring department and the company is approached. So usually uh, the parents, contact us because either the student is falling behind in a subject, they need more help, uh, they're homeschooling, they are they need just the support, they need somebody to explain the subject um, in a uh, different way, I would say, or it's not their specialty and they're having a hard time uh, clarifying the subject um, for their student. Uh, sometimes there are students who are um, basically more, um, they're, they need more advanced um, challenges, they need more problems, they are ahead of their class, so uh, the teachers uh, cannot focus on specific group of students, they have to keep, um, they have to give their, uh, their attention to everyone in the class, so the students who are uh, a little bit ahead of the class get bored and they get frustrated, so they we, we are approached by parents uh, to make sure that that student gets enough attention, enough uh, problems, enough challenges to in order to help them develop uh, even further. Uh, and then another reasons are because um, sometimes they need to improve their grades, sometimes they need uh, basically just a better understanding of a certain subject. Um, also, sometimes you have students that they need a little bit more help or attention. They have special needs. They have ADHD. They have um, basically they they are in need of uh, someone uh, additional an additional support person who can uh, who is specialized basically in teaching and who is able to find the best way to work with that specific student. And the last um, and I would say the one of the most popular reasons that we are approached by parents or students is test prep. Uh, so many of the so many of our students are just taking their um, PSAT classes, SAT classes, GRE. Um, they want to take the GRE test, so they're approaching us for those reasons. And um, as educators, um, as tutors, uh, there are a few things that we really focus on and we, we try to make sure that every student is gaining after taking their classes um, oh, and in order to ensure that we have to uh, customize their experience. Um, every student is different. So what we do in our uh, company is that first we make sure that we are, um, the, the student is going through an uh, assessment process or assessment test to basically realize where they stand, what their weaknesses are, and sometimes to even know what their strengths are so we can use those strengths uh, because sometimes the strengths are not only focused on a specific subject. Uh, there are strengths that there are, for example, it can be a learning style that is that, stu uh, that student is very good at and we can uh, recognize that style and we can use the same learning style to help them to uh, basically improve their weaknesses. The students are getting one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, the main part of the one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one attention is that uh, the main basically effect of one-on-one -on -one attention is that each person gets enough time with their tutor and at the same time they learn how to interact with someone else usually an adult um, I mean always an adult uh, and they just it improves their um, social skills uh, it helps them communicate better um, it imp uh, it helps the tutoring or classes or even the test prep classes, they help with the uh, performances. Uh, one of the main subjects that I can't emphasize on enough uh, is the fact that 
most students um, in high school, I would say, they have lack of self-esteem when they are not able to perform well. Uh, just imagine a situation. A student is sitting in a class and she's asking, asked the question and she can't answer the question. And, and imagine the other scenario that there is another student who is able to answer every single question that the teacher is asking. And imagine how the effect of that situation would be in the self-esteem and confidence of those two students. So this is where the tutor comes in and uh, the tutor is basically um, responsible to make sure that the students is getting enough, um, to make sure that there is enough improvement and there is enough learning for that specific student uh, so they can perform better. As a result, they feel much more um, interested in studying. They uh, enjoy going to school and at the same time, their confidence level is much higher. Um, another um, benefit of tutoring is because, uh, is basically helping the students. Um, I already mentioned the um, students who are much ahead of the class in the previous slide, so I'm going to skip that one. But um, another benefit of the tutoring is that uh, when you're working with a tutor, uh, let's say you have one hour to focus on a certain subject and study. Tutor is responsible to break down that one hour into different parts, uh, different time frames, basically. And those time frames are um, allocated to certain um, weaknesses. Um, there, are, uh, for example, you can spend 15 minutes on explaining the subject, another 15 minutes on um, just extra exercises, um, and just break down and come up with a plan. Uh, so that's what the tutor does. And this helps the students with their time management skills because they learn how to uh, basically plan their time when they don't have anyone to help them uh, to be able to utilize it and use the maximum um, time they have to learn and uh, perform better. So um, this is also one of the things that uh, is very important as an educator to make sure that we are transferring to our students to learn how to focus on their uh, time management skills. Linda, would you say that during the assessment process, um, the tutor determines what kind of, um, what type or what style of a learner the student is? Perhaps the student is more kinesthetic, more audio, you know, more visual. Is, does that go into the assessment? Uh, it does, depending on the what choice uh, what choice they're making. Like sometimes we have students that they the parents prefer us to basically uh, assess the situation. So the assessment process is usually, for example, let's say I'll just just give you an example. Let's say I'm assessing a student for algebra one. Um, I would start from the easiest uh, problems and just make them a little bit harder and see how the student is performing. After that, if we have um, uh, if the parents would like, I, I usually send them the online link so they can test, take a test and they can figure out if uh, they can figure out which learning style works the best for them. What I prefer doing is that for myself to ask the student questions and to basically test them by explaining them in different ways and see which way, which method works the best for them. As soon as I figure it out, I try to focus on uh, basically the style that is working the best for that specific student. Some of them, we have students that they like to walk around, hold their um, tablet or the book and just read out loud. Those people are basically auditory learners. So they want to hear what they're um, learning. And if a student is learning best that way, I usually encourage them to record my voice when I'm working with them. And our tutors do the same thing. I mean, we we kind of have a program that we all try to um, basically apply during our sessions to kind of keep it uniform and also um, make sure that we all are providing the best service possible to our students. So um, they either record the voice and just um, keep hearing it later on if they want to listen to it again. Um, so yeah, it can be done. Um, with the tutor or by choice, depending on the parents or the student himself, it can be done um, on their own. Okay, great. Was that, yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'll just move to learning styles. What we do first is, as mentioned, um, what we do first is to focus on figuring out what the learning styles are. There are different learning styles 
there should not be limited to these four, but these are the main ones that most people use to make sure that, I mean, to basically learn the subject. So, for example, if you want to know if you're a visual learner, you can just um, see if you're learning better by watching videos, diagrams, if you need to sketch things, if you need to draw them yourself and just go over them. Uh, visual learners, uh, obviously the name already says it, they learn by looking at things, they learn by uh, diagrams, charts, um, tables. So if you're that type, then you're categorized as a visual learner. If you like to hear things, if, in, if you're in the classroom and you learn, the best by just sitting in the classroom and listening to your teacher, you can be an auditory learner. If you like listening to podcasts and you're just picking up all the subjects, then you're an auditory learner. If you like to read out loud, read, not necessarily out loud, read and write and repeat everything that you're reading. Um, I've had students that they have to basically rewrite everything a couple of times to remember. Um, those people are read and write learners. And, um, uh, the kinesthetic learners are basically, I, I am a kinesthetic learner myself. I need to experiment things. I need to, uh, let's say, um, if I'm in a lab, I'm just um, experimenting and I'm just working with um, devices and it's a hands-on experience. That is the best. That works the best for me. But necessarily kinesthetic learn, I'm, I'm not necessarily just a kinesthetic learner. I can use other methods also, other styles to improve my uh learning process and I can basically combine them. Most of us are able to combine all these learning styles. So the key is to find the best one that works for us. Not every subject can be supported. Let's say, for example, if you're learning history, you cannot always support it with you can always use the kinesthetic style to learn history. There are methods to kind of incorporate it and make it more active, but uh, Basically, you have to make sure that you read the subject, um, you keep remembering it and writing it. Uh, so there are different um, ways to combine all this. And depending on the style, we try, our tutors try to combine everything together. I do have the link for the, the methods are called work methods, work styles. So I do have the link here. If anybody would like to receive the presentation, feel free to contact us and I can send it to you. Um, I included most of the links that I used for the presentation. So uh, you can also take the test and figure out what your learning style is. And the interesting part is uh, about this questionnaire is that it tells you what your main learning style is, and also it cat groups. Um, I mean, it just gives you percentage of the rest of them, so you can know uh, what your top two, for example, learning styles are. Um, and let me just move to the next one. Okay, so one of the subjects that I really like to focus on is ADHD because we we see this a lot nowadays. And the first thing I want to say is that, yes, there are lots of students who have ADHD. Maybe, uh, I mean, the number, this is uh, 2016, I think. Yeah, it's a 2016. Um, uh, basically, yeah, the information is from 2016, but it's from CDC website. So uh, based on this, uh, we had 6.1 million students. And right now, I think in U.S., we have about, about 70 plus million students and 6.1 of them are su suffering from ADHD. Um, there are students who have the symptoms, but they're not diagnosed as ADHD patients. And I really want to emphasize on this, that if someone has ADHD, you're not alone. Don't panic. There are lots of you guys. I do have some of the symptoms, even though I'm not diagnosed as ADHD patient, patient but I do have some of them. So many of us do. And uh, it's just a problem with focus. And the good news is that the brain is trainable, so we can minimize the effects of it slowly by practicing and by working on uh, basically training the brain. Um, so how to focus? As someone who um, I'm usually very, I'm usually having a hard time focusing myself and I have tried different methods for my own uh, basically school years to figure out how I can focus. And I'm usually trying to teach the same thing to my students. So first thing that I would like to emphasize on is that physical exercise, especially with for people with ADHD, this is very important because students with ADHD are very um, active. They're kind of hyperactive. Their brain is 
just moving really fast. And uh, the, you have to somehow release that excess energy to calm down, relax, and be able to focus. The other um, main factor is nutrition. Um, based on the research, uh, there are lots of um, food and flavors and artificial coloring that they're affecting the um, activity of the brain and they can make the brain hyperactive. Even coffee is one of those which can uh, make the brain hyperactive. So uh, monitoring the food and making sure that you're kind of staying within the limits can help a lot with um, keeping the attention in a certain subject. Uh, sleep and relaxation is very important for, uh, again, it's this is one of the. Um, I can include the uh, link later on. It's a. It's one of the basically um, pillars of mental health, brain health, which is uh, important to make sure that uh, the student is getting enough sleep, and the sleep times are constant, and they get the sleep during the same hours because the brain is being trained that during those hours you need to get rest and then start functioning when you're waking up at a certain time every day. So um, basically consistency is the key. The other factor is meditation. Uh, meditation is one of the subjects that I have been focused on for a long time. Uh, I have been meditating myself for about three years and this is one of the best things actually that I've experienced. I'm able to uh, focus in less than a few minutes by just meditating slowly and it takes time to train the brain but the good news is that we can train it it is possible so um as um uh, as i mentioned about the study that um dr carol uh, dweck had uh it is possible to improve improve the uh, brain ability it is possible to improve intelligence and performance so by just practicing we can get to that point and retraining the brain is also one of the most interesting subjects. There was a research by Dr. Um, uh, Eugene Arnold, if I remember the name correctly. Yes, Dr. Eugene Arnold from um, Ohio State University. I think the research was done in 2014. Based on his research, um, focus, I mean, the brain can be uh, trained to focus on certain areas. Uh, the way that you start training the, the brain based on their research is that they start a program, let's say it's a um, video or animation. And um, from uh, their video is basically um, with a, back, a bra background of space and there is a spaceship moving around and every patient who is sitting there has to uh, focus on the spaceship, which is all the time moving around and they should not be distracted by anything else on the screen. So the longer... Um, the person gets this practice, the longer they do this, the, the, uh, the longer the time of their focus becomes. So based on his research, um, most students had um, quite a bit of improvement after doing this. So it is possible to find ways to focus regardless of um, the situation. I mean, even ADHD people have been, and, and this research has been on ADHD people, ADHD patients, and it has helped them a lot with imp improvements. Another factor um, is timing. So if you can time yourself when you're doing uh, your tasks, if you can make a schedule and go based on that schedule, I'm going to combine the last two items together because they work hand in hand. So basically, if you can have a daily schedule and start from the morning, from your morning, uh, just rule out every single task one by one. Give yourself some gap in between. I like to go based. Uh, I like to have 15 minutes breaks in between because sometimes some tasks take a little bit longer. Uh, sometimes I need to get, take a break, and I do have a hyperactive brain, so I need to get rest. I need to uh, let my brain relax and then start over with the next task. So. Um, Scheduling helps us uh, stay on track. It helps us train our brain to know that there is something coming next. And timing helps us stay focused because we know that we have to finish the task in a certain amount of time. So that's kind of pushing us to um, focus and finish the task on time. Um, another very interesting um sentence that I saw, which was by um, an entrepreneur who was diagnosed with ADHD at age of eight. 
uh, was that he mentioned that ADHD is a superpower. And uh, his name is, uh, if I remember the name correctly, just one second, I think I should have it in the presentation or... Oh, okay. I don't, but I think... Uh, okay, Dan Marshall. Okay, Dan Marshall, uh, he was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of eight. He has five companies of his own and he hired 500 people so far. And he was a millionaire at age of 27. And he believes that ADHD is a superpower and you can hyper-focus focus when you have ADHD because usually people who have focus problems, they are passionate about a subject and when they're passionate about a su subject, they can hyper-focus. It is for a short period of time, but the amount of focus that they get during that time is so, uh, basically, it's a lot that helps them uh, make uh, get more things done during a short period of time. Um, and I'd like to mention a few things about the entrepreneurs uh, who have been diagnosed with ADHD but still have been managed to uh, have been able to manage their um, life and career and balance it. There are a few people like Richard Branson, who is founder of Virgin Airlines. There is um, David uh, Newman, who is founder of, and CEO of JetBlue Airways, and um, there is John Chambers. He is the CEO of Cisco Systems. All these people have been able to use their basically superpower uh, and uh, make their life, basically make themselves more successful. And interest, the interesting fact about the ADHD people is that, believe it or not, they are 300% more likely to start their own business. And the reason is that they can't stop thinking. They can't stop thinking. They're very innovative. And that's giving uh, it's giving them uh, more opportunity, more uh, basically, more challenges. I would say because uh, for as long as the brain is working and it's racing, they keep thinking about new things that they can do, and they keep um, trying to basically um, achieve their goals because they can't rest for as long as they don't do it. So, um, Linda, would you be able to maybe also? kind of goes into how about retention of um, facts, maybe possible, what are some strategies um, some students may, that you found to be best for students that have a difficult time retaining certain facts and um, memorization and things like that? Sure. So uh, what I like to do with the students is that there is this, um, so there is there are different methods to remember um, different um, subjects. For example, what I like to do with my students is creating some kind of abbreviations. So what we do is that we come up with our own uh, names, abbreviations, and we try to come up with a rhythm, a song, maybe uh, anything that can help a student to basically remember. Uh, I usually uh, like to encourage them to come up with even something graphic that they can paint, and that helps them um, remember all the sub, basically uh, all the information that they are learning. Um, it is uh, this is called uh, mnemonic devices. So usage usage of mnemonic devices. So basically, mnemonic devices are the techniques that the person can use to help them improve their ability to uh, remember something. So in other word, words, it's a technique to help your brain to encode uh, important information. It can be, um, as mentioned, phrases, rules, diagrams, um, and uh, they can just use them to memorize. Uh, if you can sh just, let's say, memorize one word and each um, each letter of that word can represent something and you can just remember it by um, remembering remember the, the whole thing by just remembering the one word, then that's just um, making your life much easier and making the process of learning easier for the students. So that's what um, I suggest to my own students. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think with that, uh, I am going to end my part of the presentation because the next part is the college counseling and Daniel um, should take over. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this uh, presentation. Um, I want to thank NARE and ASA for uh, giving us the opportunity uh, to share our um, thoughts and our um, strategies and techniques 
with the audience. And I want to thank everyone for taking the time uh, this evening to join us. Um, so just want to say that uh, our company is situated uh, strategically in this time and in the, in the area to assist students uh, develop a, a learning, you know, a growth mindset to help students uh, address their uh, educational needs and families. Uh, as all of you know, we're living in a very uh, challenging time uh, right now with the uh, pandemic and the virus that's uh, caused schools to close since March. And um, a lot of schools and educational institutions have uh, transferred into um, virtual online learning, 100%. And uh, with that, parents have become the primary teachers for their students. And um, this has created a lot of challenges that I've been hearing um, in, um, amongst a lot of families and, and parents. Uh, some of the parents um, are struggling in certain areas in terms of giving their students support uh, in the subjects that they're learning, whether it's elementary school, middle school, or high school. And um, we want to give parents a resource and an ability to be able to reach out to professional educators who can support your student to be able to succeed uh, in, the, in the learning process. And as uh, Linda was uh, mentioned in great detail, we really work from where the student is and we assess where they are, what their weaknesses are, and we try to help them develop and strengthen those weaknesses so they become areas of strengths for them. And uh, part of our company is the tutoring, as Linda was mentioning, and another part of it is the college admissions consulting. And these two basically go hand in hand uh, because in order to uh, get admitted to a college, a top university, uh, you need to be a strong student. And you need to uh, master core areas, core subjects such as science, math, uh, social science, uh, history, and, and the like. So what we do is we uh, assist students in those areas so they're able to build a good, strong academic portfolio and uh, transcript so that they're, they have more opportunities when they're getting ready to apply to the university uh, universities. Um, as you may know, uh, it's a very competitive time that we live in in terms of admissions, and it's getting more, more and more difficult to get into um, some of the top universities. Of course, you know, we're in Los Angeles. A lot of our students and families always ask about, you know, how do I get into USC and how do I get into UCLA? And um, they happen to be a couple of the more competitive universities in the country to get into, which um, means that students have to start at an even earlier age in order to prepare and in order to um, have the ability to uh, go to these top universities. So they need to start early. They need to start developing their strengths. Uh, they need to um, become excellent students. So briefly, I want to kind of shed some light into what the areas are that universities look for in terms of the college admissions process. Um, there are three areas. There are three main components of the admissions process. One of them is the curricular rigor. I'll start with the second bullet point. Uh, that includes the classes that students take basically starting the ninth grade when they're in high school. And uh, the level of the courses that they take is, is essential um, because universities are looking for students who challenge themselves in the type of classes they take. So just not taking the minimum level of rigor, but actually challenging yourself and taking harder classes is important because that shows resilience and that shows um, that you've challenged yourself and you're capable of doing college level work. So when we start in the ninth grade, we want to make sure that the students are entering high school, um, given that they're taking the 
most rigorous courses that they're capable of taking. And um, in our community, when I review a lot of, uh, when I work with parents and I talk to families and I review their transcripts and their middle school records, I notice that unfortunately, a lot of our students are mis uh, enrolled or not enrolled in the classes that they need to be enrolled in, which has very uh, dramatic uh, repercussions as they're moving through high school. Because uh, by being in a math class that is lower or beneath the level that you're capable of handling, could could throw you off the rest of the time off in 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 high school. Um, and depending on what your major is. Sometimes you need to have a lot of, for example, math. Uh, uh, engineering was mentioned tonight. Uh, in, uh, Linda mentioned engineering. Uh, for example, for engineers or students who want to go into engineering, you know, they need to have at least two years of calculus in high school to, to be competitive. Um, and in order to do that, you have to work yourself back to the ninth grade and make sure that when you're entering ninth grade from middle school, you are placed in, let's say, Algebra 2 or Honors Algebra 2. Now, again, we, we're, I'm finding a lot of issues with students that are mis, um, uh, misscheduled and uh, uh, that parents don't advocate for their students in order for them to be where they need to be. And uh, once you're mis-enrolled um, uh, in, in, a, in a particular class, that could present issues. Uh, in terms of matriculating into uh, the university level. And uh, piggybacking on what uh, Linda was talking about earlier, if students have gaps in their understanding and in their knowledge, um, that's what we are here for. Uh, to, our tutoring department is here to address those gaps and build those skills that were missed. And this is a very common occurrence across the board. So you will have a lot of students that have struggled in pre-algebra and now they're struggling in algebra and then now they have to take geometry and it just continues. It's a cumulative effect of the, the struggles keep on lingering because they were not able to go back and address some of the weaknesses or some of the areas that they, not, they did not really grasp uh, because as any, anyone would, would say, you know, all the teachers and tutors would say, Especially in mathematics, it's, it's, it, it builds. It's a building block. So one concept uh, builds upon another concept. And when, when there are missing links or if the foundation is not laid well, then it definitely shows later on as students are progressing in their, in their education, uh, um, different grades. So that's an example of the second bullet point. When, when we mean, what we mean by curricular rigor is, again, what are you taking, you know, are you taking um, challenging classes? Now, the way students take challenging classes is by taking what we call honors and AP courses in high school. Um, the different high schools offer a different number of AP courses. Some high schools offer 10 AP courses overall um, as part of the school offering, and some schools offer 17. Others may offer 25 courses. So what are you taking and are you challenging yourself? Uh, if you want to be a pre-med, are you taking, uh, you know, AP biology? Are you taking AP chemistry or are you just, just taking regular level courses? Um, of course, we want to make sure as an admissions consulting company, we want to make sure that your student is taking the, the correct courses and the right level of rigor for them to be able to be successful and to be able to be strong candidates when they are getting ready to apply for college. Um, bullet point number three I'll talk about next, and that's about uh, the standardized exams. Those have historically also been very important when it comes to the college admissions process. So the two main exams that you may all may have heard of is the SAT and the ACT. And uh, those uh, have been part of the admissions requirements for a number of years for the most uh, selective universities. So the UCs uh, have had have used the SAT score as part of the admissions criteria to get into the UC system. Now, for students in the class of 2021, 
There is a temporary mor moratorium on the standardized exams, which means that for class, for students that are rising seniors that are going to be 12th graders this year, when they apply for college, the SAT and the ACT are going to be optional for them. But that does not mean that you should not take it. Now, some people interpret that as not needing to take it, which I don't agree with. Uh, so as an advisor, as a counselor, I would definitely advise students to still take it and produce the score because it's going to give the university an objective measure by which to decide if they want to select the student or not. Um, and there are other exams. Uh, for example, the AP exams, as I mentioned earlier, uh, students can take AP advanced placement courses in high school, which also can give them college credit when they uh, go to college. Uh, if they take a test um, and pass the test with a certain number uh, point from usually three to five is the score that they need to achieve in order to get college credit for the co courses that they take in high school. And then, of course, we have the subject area tests, which students can take. And this, the purpose of the subject test is to highlight areas of strengths that uh, students want to show. So you can take a subject test in math and science if you're applying for STEM-related uh, majors in college in order to highlight your strengths in the STEM area. So there are various exams and various tests that you can uh, take and uh, to be the competitive candidates in the admissions process. And finally, I want to speak about the third bullet point. Um, which is extracurricular activities. Extracurricular activities are also very important uh, because they show if a student has uh, built up their passion in an area that they're interested in. So uh, I'm going to give you an example of an extracurricular activity. Uh, for example, if a student wants to go to uh, medical school or wants to be pre-med at a university, uh, what have they done in high school in order to build, uh, show, demonstrate to the universities that they really truly have a passion to go to medical school. So uh, we advise them to, um, to um, you know, do an internship at a hospital and uh, to, um, to uh, spend time maybe at a clinic to develop their, um, uh, you know, their strengths in the area of uh, uh, medicine. You know, and then engineers can do that in, in, in an engineering environment. Uh, lawyers can do that in a law firm and, and, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, music and sports and those passions are also very important. If a student has uh, played music for a number of years, uh, who has done a sport for a number of years, or has volunteered in the community, those are also extremely important. Um, so even... Yeah. Would you be able, sorry to cut you off, would you yeah. be able to also elaborate on, um, you know, there's a lot of students where they have various activities, they're also juggling academic, their academics. What are some strategies that they can um, manage all these different things and not get overwhelmed? And how much is taking on too much? How do they, um, yes. what are some strategies yeah. they can use? Thank you, Naria. That's a great question. So the key to, when it comes to extracurricular activities, strategies, the, the main key, there's a formula for extracurriculars, which is um, um, uh, time, the duration of the time, and how much you endure in that activity. So a lot of students keep, do a lot of different activities, which is not what universities actually are looking for. So for the audience that's listening tonight, a lot of parents and families are are uh, really put their students in a lot of activities, which can backfire because they don't do something at a deeper level where, where it becomes meaningful for them. So a strategy in terms of extracurriculars is to do one or two things in more in depth and for a longer period of time. Um, so I would say for that student who's a musician, I would completely... Uh, recommend that student to continue playing music, even if they were from like the year eight years old all the way to high school, and to do performances and to also perform at their uh, at their musical society. You know, um, I've worked with, for example, Lark, which is a musical society. Uh, many of our audience members can relate to. 
And it's great because those students really deepen uh, their passion for music by being part of that society for a long period of time. And also sports. You know, if you're a soccer player or you're a swimmer or you're a volleyball player, it's recommended that you engage in that activity for a long period of time. Instead of doing small bits and pieces of doing this activity for three months and then jumping to another activity. So I would definitely highlight the endurance aspect of participating in an extracurricular activity. Right. Good point. Um, so these are the main aspects, and, and this fits well with our tutoring, with, with tutoring, as was mentioned earlier, because we develop the entire student. The growth mindset is what we recommend. Uh, we want students to address their weaknesses, build up on their strengths, and have a roadmap for the future for for, for the university, uh, and start focusing on the areas and building their strengths. Uh, and so we can make a good case for them when they're getting ready to apply, when they're doing their personal statements, and then uh, applying for the university. You know, a lot of people are also always looking for um, really great resources and tools for college prep. Um, college, you know, test prep. Um, are there any that you can elaborate on that, you know, make perhaps some free resources? Um, Absolutely, yes. Resources and. Yes, yeah, sure, of course. Um, so when it comes to uh, the SAT, which is the main exam that is used, um, there is definitely a free resource from College Board. So College Board is the parent company that houses the SAT and the AP exam tests. And when you take your PSAT, so students take their PSAT when they're in high school for free. And what they can do is when they get, it, they get their results, usually by taking them in sophomore, as a sophomore, they can connect for free with College Board and do practice questions on College Board. So College Board works with a company called Khan Academy. A lot of the viewers and listeners may be familiar with Khan Academy, which is an online tutorial uh, tutoring-based um, company. And what they do is uh, Khan Academy analyzes the questions that have been missed on the PSAT, and it offers them customized uh, questions in order for students to be able to practice. And this is a great resource for students to utilize and it's absolutely free. And they have an account by the mere fact that they take the PSAT in school. So I would definitely recommend that website. Um, I think we're open to answering any questions that audience members could have on. Sure, yes, let's get to the Q&A section. Um, just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, please um, submit them into the chat box, into the question box, and we'll get to your questions. Um, are there any note-taking methods that either Linda, you or Daniel, I know Linda, I've seen your notes, you're a really good note-taker. Um, Daniel, I haven't seen your notes, but I'm sure you have some suggestions of your own. Um, do either one of you want to elaborate on some um, techniques? Um. I think I can take this question. Yeah. So um, as far as note-taking goes, um, I usually suggest students to, um, I mentioned it during presentation too, to record the voice. Basically, uh, ask your teacher first because if you don't, they don't allow you, you're not supposed to do it. So try recording it. Um, what I used to do was I would record it, I would listen to it and rewrite the notes again based on what I would hear. So I would take the notes in the classroom, I would rewrite them, after hearing the basically the details because you learn every single time that you listen to it you learn more and you notice more details so that's what i would do i would use color as much color as needed to make sure that i have something graphic to remember especially if you have a um basically your um you can remember diagrams and pictures well that helps you a lot uh, feel free to highlight as much as you can. That's what I would suggest. Uh, highlighters help me a lot uh, with my notes, and I like to um, categorize them. So um, after listening to the audio, I would categorize everything, group them, create flashcards. They help me a lot. I would re review the flashcards every night uh, for, let's say, before. Uh, well, I'm, I 
suggest students to not to study the night before exam and try to review everything um, at least a few weeks before preparing for the test. I mean, you have to be studying, you have to study for your class every session, but for the final exam, usually students start learning, studying more. So if you're doing that, you should have flashcards to help you review everything quickly. Um, make sure to write down the examples even though if you have a book and the example is there, make sure to write them down yourself and solve them yourself and add them to your notes because usually there are some key points in the examples and you're supposed to learn by solving them. So you can pick them up one by one and um, rewrite your notes after the class. That's especially if you are a reading, writing um, style learner, that would that will help you a lot. Um, and um, uh, share the notes. So ask your friends for their notes, uh, check them out and make sure you have all the information you need for your class. Uh, and yeah, that sums it up. Sums it up. If, Great, if I can add to that, I think sure. another helpful uh, strategy is to study in groups. Um, right. I think studying, uh, you know, they say you don't know something unless you know how to teach it. I, I really believe in that, uh, um, in that idiom, in that uh, truth. I think studying in small groups and having students teach the material to one another is also very, uh, very important and can be very helpful. And I concur with every other point that Linda mentioned in terms of taking notes, in terms of color coding, in terms of categorizing, um, you know, and it taps into all of the learning styles that were mentioned before. So uh, as long as you, if you get a lot of those learning style strategies into a learning experience i think the brain retains that more and it's ingrained more in the brain so um listening writing visualizing uh, and doing are all critical um i completely concur with that that's a great strategy um you know sometimes testing out different strategies for the student works really well because sometimes you don't know until you try it out and perhaps the student in a social setting, um, retains more information, perhaps. So that's that's a great tip. Um, we do have some other questions as well. Someone is asking AP and honors, uh, taking AP or honors classes in high school or taking college classes. Which one is better for college entrance? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, this individual is very uh, knowledgeable of the of the process. It sounds like. Uh, thank you for your question. I would say both are very beneficial for a student. Or college admissions. So if you can take AP and honors courses and also take community college courses while you're in high school, community college courses basically function as an AP course in terms of the extra grade point that you earn by taking a community college class. In addition to that, community college classes can actually transfer if the right course is taken uh, at the community college, if it's a transferable class. Uh, then you can actually transfer to the university so you have less units to complete once you're at the university. So all of these strategies are very uh, beneficial. It depends on the student, what they want to do, what their goals are. Uh, we can use a mix of these, these strategies, a mix and match of these strategies in order to boost them as a student. That's great. Um, kind of touching upon the same topic, um, an audience member is asking, some high schools don't give college credit for AP classes. Um, this person heard Clark is a good school, but doesn't give that credit. Do you know anything about that? Um, can you re re restate the question? Some high schools don't give? They don't give college credit for AP courses. Um, and they heard that Clark is a good school, but doesn't give this type of credit. Do you know anything about this topic? Um, I, I'm not specifically um, aware of the of, of the AP, you know, the courses in terms of Clark Magnet High School, but generally speaking, an AP course is approved by the UC system. So, uh, so the high school has to submit their courses for approval by the UC system, and if it is approved, then those courses will get college credit if the student takes the AP course and they successfully pass the AP exam. 
usually a, a number, a point total of three, four, and five will earn you college credit for an AP class if they pass it. Okay, you're great. Um, what about career technical education in high school? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? I, I, it has its use. Uh, you know, some students are very kinesthetic. Again, going back to our word, you know, one of the words, key terms for tonight. So they like to manipulate, they like to touch, they like to work with their hands. And there's there's definitely a place for students that are, you know, specifically more, um, they like those areas, you know, for example, and there, there's culinary arts in high school, there is a, a wood shop, uh, there is, um, you know, me mechanic shop or mechanics, um, uh, graphic arts, you know, there are different uh, technical and uh, technically related subjects in high school that students can take. I have no issues with that as long as that's what the student is likes to do and they're good at it and they have a passion for. Um, and if that's what they want to do, that is not a problem at all. And they can, of course, move on to a college or a technical university and and. Uh, get a degree or a certificate later on as they progress in, in their education. Right. Um, and I, I know a lot of parents might have questions about how soon should they make sure that their um, children are taking the right level of courses, um, they're not taking too few classes. I, let's say middle school, um, an audience member has a son in seventh grade and has some concerns about how she can better prepare him and make sure he's taking the correct level of courses? Yes. So that's another very good question. Um, middle school is, is critical in terms of because it's the transition between elementary school and high school. So when we see students rise to the occasion in middle school and kind of develop both emotionally, physically, and, and cognitively, um, we want to make sure that the students are taking the right courses. We want to make sure that the students are taking advanced courses because there are, there are advanced courses in middle school as compared to regular courses. So for that parent, I would want to know whether my student is taking an advanced course in math, science, English, social science, or whether they're on the regular track. And if they're capable of doing the advanced level work, I would encourage the parent to advocate for their child so that they are put placed in these advanced courses. Because I, as I emphasized and I focused, as Linda was saying, to focus on the on the in the matter, uh, you know, that will determine the path when they're in high school. So whether they're in that advanced course in middle school or if they're in their regular school, will will kind of set the tone when they come to high school. So we don't want the students to be at a lower level course if they have the ability to. Uh, be at a, on a you know on a on a higher track, right. and and uh, you know of course families can reach out to us if they want to understand this better, but at the least I think parents should advocate for their students. Parents are the number are 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 the number one, um, you know they play the number one role in advocating for their students by asking questions, by speaking to administrators, by making sure that their students are getting the best education possible at whatever level they're on, they're at. So um, uh, I would say to that parent, you know, make sure whatever middle school it is, let's say it's Wilson Middle School or in Glendale or whether it's Roosevelt or, or Rosemont or, or Shamlian, right, the Armenian school, make sure that they're taking the right courses um, and then they're being challenged, as I mentioned, which is one of the major parts of college admissions, is whether the student is taking the right, w a rigorous level of course, course load, instead of just, you know, taking that regular level. Right. So a lot of it comes down to seeing if the student is challenged enough and testing different um, levels to see what's the right level for that student at that time. I'm um, going back to that question about career technical education. Um, just to clarify the question a little further, um, my question is, does CTE, career technical education, look good for college admission, someone's asking? 
Uh, career technical education taken in high school, Does it? Is that what the question is, whether that looks good for college admissions? Uh, well, it depends on what your goals are, again. It, it, it all depends on what your goals are. So if you're going to be a pre-med or if you're going to go into law or if you're going to go to research-based majors like engineering, uh, then C, uh, CTE is not as directly uh, relevant, I guess I can say, with those majors. But if you are, uh, you know, you want to become a chef, let's say, and you want to you know, go to culinary arts school, or you want to be um, uh, a graphic designer, you know, then that would definitely uh, build you up in those areas. And you can do both. You can still go to uh, medical school and take some couple of classes as, a, as an elective, right, in, in high school in the CTE just to get some experience. Mm -hmm. So that's fine as well. That's okay. That's perfectly okay to do. Um, so it's, it's relative, uh, it's relative to your goals and what you're trying to do, whether that's going to be a good fit for you. I, that's my answer. Okay, great. Um, any test um, prep tricks that you might want to elaborate on? Um, should I take the question? Okay. Sure, go ahead. So um, for the test prep, um, I would say the first thing to consider is that you have to uh, identify uh, where your problems are. Um, so you identify your problems, then get help. Don't be shy. Nowadays, everyone has access to internet and you can email your teachers anytime you want. Ask them questions. Keep asking until you learn. Asking is the key. And for as long as you ask questions, it means you're showing your instructors that you're interested in the subject. It doesn't take anything away from your value or knowledge. So feel free to ask. Write and rewrite your notes. The more you repeat, the better you uh, retain the information. Um, try to answer all the questions on the test, unless there is a test which has negative points. If you're answering incorrectly, there is there is no reason to not to answer and leave anything um, like blank. So make sure to answer everything. Um, take advantage of extra credit assignments during the basically school year or the semester make sure to um, submit all of them uh, know what the test format is knowing the test format helps you uh, with time management and helps you prepare better and uh, also try to make sure that you take sample tests as much as you can before taking the main test especially for the test prep courses uh, for example if you are taking uh, SAT it's better if you take, let's say, 10 sample courses before your main course. That helps you with time management, helps you with focus, helps you know what is next, helps you learn the type of the questions you're going to see. And the more you solve, the easier it becomes. So you can solve the easier problems faster and you're going to have more time for the problems that are more challenging. So you can put more, times on, more time on those and answer them correctly. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Linda. Some sure. great tips here. And, um... What about, I know there's this hot topic of, it's always a hot topic, uh, procrastination. You know, what are some strategies students and parents can both utilize um, in order to prevent, just it sort of plays into time management and to prevent just that procrastination that inevitably happens to a lot of people? Do you want to take it or should I? Go ahead. So, um... I would say uh, for most students, yeah, you're right. We see this a lot. And um, unfortunately, so many of the students have a problem with uh, planning and scheduling. And I would say the more you have, basically, if you have a planner, daily planner, or you, if you have a calendar of event and you can, events, and you can just basically focus on everything that you have to do do on daily basis and make sure that you promise yourself, basically yourself for your own good, that you're not going to uh, skip anything and you're going to focus uh, and finish everything because finishing tasks is very important. It's not just about time management, but also making sure that you finish things and you don't leave them off halfway done. So um, basically, it's all about planning, commitment, and making sure that you um, you're able to um, finish the tasks, but also give yourself some uh, margin for like time to ensure that you have the enough time. 
if you're short, you can just give, give yourself 15 minutes, 20 minutes extra time. So you can just use that time to finish a task earlier and you can take a break later on. Take care of yourself and take your breaks because me time is very important. Resting is very important. If you don't do that, you're not able to follow any kind of schedule because your brain gets too tired to uh, process more data. And, and I, I just want to add that having viewing your goals, constantly being reminded of what where you're trying to go, what you're trying to achieve, and what you're trying to accomplish. Right is an antidote to pro procrastination in the sense that you you have goals you need to fulfill. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes students, they get into like a slumber because they don't know what's where they're going or what they want to do in their life. And no one is there to remind them. They just are, are in, a, in a kind of a, in a, in a daze and, you know, they're just going through the routine and there is no meaning to what they're doing. So uh, when you when you're working with uh, experts, educators, tutors, and admissions counselors, you know our goal is to always motivate students in terms of letting them know where the journey leads to. And in order for you to get there, you have to have good grades. Not only that, you have to have good test scores. And then the third thing was you need to be very active in the community and do extracurricular activities. And then based on that, you kind of start, you know, setting your daily, monthly goals and then weekly goals and your daily goals. Right. Um, but we need reminders, especially young students. They need adults to hold them accountable for their learning uh, objectives. So I, I just want to emphasize that point. I think it's very important. I like to add one more thing to this. Um, I suggest, I always tell my students to use vision boards. And what they do is that we create something, we go back and they can do it on their own. Uh, they go back and they check their short-term goals and long-term goals. And based on that, they plan ahead for everything. And I think planning on a weekly basis works. I mean, you need to have your daily tasks, to-do list basically, but you need to have some goals to make sure. For example, if you're to take an S uh, to take the SAT test this week and you have to finish it, you have to take it this week and you have to make sure that you do it by the end of the week and prize yourself at the end. Because if you're achieving something, you deserve a prize. Uh, you, de you deserve to feel good about yourself because you're doing something um, positive. And try to try new things, try to incorporate something new in your life that keeps you excited so you don't get tired of the same routine all the time. That's also another thing to keep to make sure that your brain starts fresh and you always have that motivation and you don't get tired. Any advice for what college recruiters look for in athletes? Um, how can this parent prepare um, for their high school um, student who is an athlete? Um, what what sport? Any sport or what specific sport are they an athlete in? Um, I'm not aware, but we can find out. Hi, excuse me. Uh, do we have some, some general advice? Um, sure. Um, athletes, depending on what their sport is, they have opportunities to um, uh, play sports at a, at a, at a higher ed, you know, at the university level. Uh, they have to, depending on how competitive they are, and if they're at a level where they're being recruited, by uh, universities um, and then athletes have another qualifying board which is the NCAA that sets certain requirements for them to accomplish in terms of their GPA and in terms of their the courses that they take in high school um, so, uh, the general remarks would be to make sure that they're NCAA eligible and that um, they're they're being competitive and they're being recruited and some some athletes also play club sports while they're in high school so um depending on that's why i asked about the sport for example hey. soccer also has um, 
sorry for interrupting you. I just saw that they answered baseball. That was their answer to the question. They said baseball. baseball. Yeah. So uh, the, does the student maybe play in a league or are they on the school baseball team? You know, um, so those are all relevant. And of course, the coaches also help with the recruitment process. So it depends on how competitive they are. Um, and everything else applies. You know, they still have to have good grades in order to get into better universities or to be recruited by better universities. Right. Uh, or more selective universities. Right. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I would say about athletes. But it's definitely, uh, you know, athletes are coveted because they have a unique and special talent. Um, we just need to make sure that their grades are there, their test scores are there, and and they're, they're being recruited. There is some kind of a connection between the university and that family, that student. Right. Um, I think Nora got disconnected. <laughs> I don't see her anymore. Oh. Yeah, she did, because I am receiving the questions. I'm not supposed to be receiving them, but I'm receiving okay. them. So, yeah. Oh, as, actually, their answer was that uh, travel league homeschooling child. So that's about the um, baseball okay. athlete that you're talking. Yeah. Oh, travel league. So if the student, if that particular athlete is in travel league, that means they're very serious about their sport. And that's uh, definitely uh, a plus. And I'm assuming they're playing on their probably like a varsity baseball player in their school, at their school. So yeah, um, I'm not sure. I'm sure they're a very competitive player and. I would want to look at that student to see what our options are um, in terms of college. Um, I see one more question for us. Uh, I'm going to answer this one, but Nara is not here, so I don't know if she's having difficulty rejoining the event or not. So for a um, kinesthetic learner, what are some suggestions to make the learning process easier? Uh, for a kinesthetic learner, um, usually it's suggested to have something which is hands-on, more active. Um, interestingly, I find listening to music, chewing gum, um, taking short breaks uh, after short time of studying, very helpful. Uh, if they are studying for 30 minutes, and they should take like about 5 to 10 minutes break because they need to release that energy. They need to have movement. So another thing that is uh, very uh, oh basically helpful for kinesthetic learners is that if they sit at the front it's very helpful for them because they need to see the instructor move around and they they need to see all the basically mimic and all the hand gestures uh it helps them focus so uh and it helps them uh basically absorb all the information faster so that's um that's a few of my suggestions uh for kinesthetic learners um and i think I'm not sure why Nara is not able to join, but it's okay. So um, I'll just talk on behalf of it. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to talk on behalf of ASA. I'm an ASA member, so I'm going to talk on behalf of ASA at this part. Um, if you have anything to add, Daniel, um, please go ahead and um, any mm -hmm. suggestion, advice. In the meantime, uh, I, I was just going to let the family, uh, the uh, audience know, you know, that if they need more resources, uh, they can get in touch with us. Um, I don't know if we have the contact information available still, but uh, we are more than welcome to follow up with us if they have questions or if they need more resources or more suggestions or help. Uh, sure. They can definitely reach out for us. And, if they want, maybe they can leave their email with us and we can email them the presentation. Sure, sure. And if uh, if there are families who need free resources, also feel free to reach out to us. Uh, both Daniel and I uh, volunteer a lot in community, so we are more than happy to help as much as we can because the goal is to make sure we are empowering our youth and we are make sure that we have a successful next generation. Um, and thank you, Daniel. I'm going to thank you on behalf of ASA because... <laughs> Right now, I'm not thank representing um, representing Edge Pros. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, and uh, if you're interested in joining ASA, uh, you can find us. Um, you can just look up our website, asa.org. And um, we have different committees working in different areas. Um, they're very active. We do have also uh, robotics and science Olympiad for younger generation, for our high school students and middle school students. They can also participate. And um, yeah, with that, I'm going to end today's session.
reception uh, today's event. Uh, thank you for joining and have a great night. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Uh-huh.